guys this morning to um, our Easter service and, and just declare that the Lord is risen. Woo-hoo! He's risen indeed, and we have so much to celebrate, so we're glad you're here with us. Uh, I just want to give you just really one announcement <clears throat> this morning, and that is that um, there are packets in, in the fellowship hall. Um, if you guys want to come throughout the week, if you have children, um, they're, they're resurrection packets, and I, I, I think we should leave them out for a little while longer. Um, I know that quite a few people came in and grabbed some for their kids to do the at the cra- crafts and activities and the works pages there um, for the, re- the resurrection. Three through fifth grade. Three through fifth grade. So and if, we're going to leave those up for a little while if you guys want to do that and remember this awesome event of history that we get to look at this morning. Please feel free to do that. We're going to start out this morning with some worship. So join us and and let's bring our hearts before our great and awesome Lord, our Savior, our risen, our resurrected Savior who is alive. And this mic isn't on, but that's all right because we'll get it on pretty soon. Cue Richard. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves his presence in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing. This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I see done for me. Please, I can't. 
can see in Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. Yeah. 
Trampling over death by death Come away, come away Come and rise up from the grave This is risen from the dead with us and not just looking at us but raising your hearts and your hands and your voices to our risen Savior this morning. I'm thankful to be here. 
I'm thankful that we have this. I, I know I say it just about every time that we, we meet and that we speak and we talk together, but I know I'm, I just have to say it again. I'm thankful that we have something. Uh, this media, this, um, this you know, bus, if you will, uh, which to reach uh, you and to be together. Um, and I know that for me personally, <clears throat> for the most of the time, I'm up here sharing and I'm just kind of sharing to a mostly empty room and, and to a, a phone and a, you know, a camera, what, what have you, but um, I'm thankful for some of the praise reports for people coming and encouraging and saying, hey, you know, keep doing what you're doing. It might feel like that to you, but to us, we get to, to be a part of the church still. And we get to see what's going on. We get to hear the word of God. So I'm grateful to gather with you this morning in this way. And today, if you haven't noticed or haven't known yet, today it's Resurrection Sunday. And praise God for Resurrection Sunday. Praise God. So I just want to this morning welcome you and just say happy Resurrection Day to you. Happy Resurrection Day. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And I'll just go ahead and say the, the other half of that thing we so often say. He is risen indeed. And I know in our church we like to, we like to get a little rowdy on Resurrection Day. We like to say the Lord is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Right, and so we like to get a little rowdy, and because we're excited because of the fact that there is an empty tomb, and not just that, but that He has indeed risen from the grave. So this morning we're going to look at Resurrection Day on this Resurrection Sunday, and we're going to be talking about the resurrection, and we're going to be talking a, a little bit more about the recorded history, and a little bit more about the evidence of this resurrection that we have. And just how strong that evidence is, um, uh, we're going to like very briefly a little bit compare it to some other events in history that happen. Uh, and like I said, just kind of very briefly, but just to kind of to, to let us know and understand. And, and the goal of this message and the end of this, the, the result of this is just to just consolidate, to confirm in our hearts that we have the truth. And Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And so this is important for us. So the resurrection, this recorded event in history, which quite simply is Jesus raising from the dead after being crucified and buried, and then being the first to be resurrected. So Jesus, after that burial, was the first, or as some like to call it, some of the gospel writers um, like to call it, Jesus being the firstborn from the dead. You might be thinking, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it's exactly what it says it is. It's the very first one to be resurrected, the firstborn from the dead. So I wanted to give you just a couple of descriptions of this. And the first one is in the book of Colossians chapter 1. If you want to flip there with me, you're more than welcome. Flip with me in your Bibles. Hopefully you have your Bibles. Hopefully you have them out. Uh, I think that um, that Richard put on that the that the main um, verse is going to be in 1 Corinthians, and that is correct. But turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 um, here. And in Colossians chapter 1, we have a, a description of Jesus, of who Jesus is by Paul. In verse 15 of chapter 1, it says this. Paul says, he is the image of the invisible God. I, I'm sorry, but I have to stop there for just one moment. Because Paul is showing us something that's very important for us as Christians, as believers, to understand. If you want to see God, we have an exact example, an exact representation of God, of how God would act, of what he would say, of what he does in people's lives, how he touches them, heals and restores and moves on this earth. And that exact representation, that, according to verse 15, image is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. How grateful we are to have this record and this representation of God in the person of Jesus. And he goes on to say, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He's what holds everything together. 
Without him, there's nothing. And then moving on, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn of creation. He's the firstborn from the dead. It's an, it's an amazing picture that we have of Jesus being over everything, even death. And he's the firstborn of the dead in order to prove to us that he is over death. He's above death. That he would prove that in all things he has preeminence. This is an amazing description from Paul, really describing to us Jesus as God. This is Jesus. Jesus is God. He's the only one that created that can create all these things and do everything that he did and rise from the dead to prove the point. He is God, and he is the firstborn from the dead. There's another verse, and you can jot this one down, Revelation chapter 1. I'm just going to read just a little part of it right here, starting in verse 5. It says, And Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What an awesome depiction of who Jesus is. And after saying that, uh, the writer here, Johnny, couldn't help but stop and say, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And he couldn't just stop there. He said, and behold, he's coming in the clouds. He speaks to the fact that Jesus is going to come and make all things right. Though spiritually, he has done that in our lives. Amen. He's made all things right because we have been, like it says, loved and washed in his precious blood, been bought and purchased and made clean by him. Okay, just a couple of verses that mention Jesus being the firstborn over the dead. I wanted to kind of have that in here and just show you this. This is what this is talking about. Both of these scriptures that we mentioned this morning are very important to us as believers because it's the resurrection of Jesus that the writers are talking about. And this is a truth that we, we as Christians, Christians, one church, one body, throughout time, throughout history, all of us together, the body of Christ, the believers of the, uh, of the resurrection, of the, of the testament of Jesus Christ, we've believed in this resurrection for over 2,000 years since the actual event, the historical event, of his death, burial, and resurrection took place. And I would say of the resurrection, it has been, and like I said, I agree 100%, the single greatest central belief in the Christian belief system. It's, it's like one of those cogs in there that if you take that belief out, it, the rest of the wheels are just kind of turning. There's no traction. The resurrection is one of, if not the most important part and piece of the doctrine that we believe as his disciples. And the reason I say that, because the cross is as equally as important. The death that he died for our sins is equally as important. But the reason I say the resurrection almost would be like a notch or a step above the importance level is, is only this. Because without it, we're sunk. Without it, all we have is an empty tomb. And oh, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Let, let's back up one second. I jumped the gun. Without it, we have a tomb that wasn't empty, that isn't empty without the resurrection. So without it, really, all we have is the words of this man. Now, we do have his actions because they're recorded as well. But all we have is the words of a man that says, I am God and I'm going to save you and then died and remained dead. And, and the reason I bring that point up is, listen, Anyone can say, I'm God, and die and remain dead. Doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't prove the fact. But if someone said, I am God, and died and rose from the dead, we have a very sure validation of what has happened and who he is, and that he is who he says he is. There's one other issue we should have to deal with. And of course, 
It's the actions of Jesus. And there, I mentioned it really briefly because what Jesus did when he walked on this earth was something that no one else has done in history. He was so much over everything in this world, in this life. He was over death. Uh, he raised someone from the dead before raising himself. If you remember Lazarus, if you remember the girl who was sick and, and, and died and he went and touched her and healed her, brought her and said she was only sleeping. If you remember, he was over nature. The wind and the waves obeyed him. If you remember, he was over every sickness. If you remember, he was over every demon, every spiritual being he's over. And so as we see through his life, I mean, this isn't the only evidence that he is God, but the resurrection is a very key and important evidence. Now, that's not just me saying how important it is. Let's also look at the Word of God. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul wrote about the evidence of the resurrection and how important it is. And that's going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So get your Bibles, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, and here it is. And I, and I heard through the grapevine that some of you guys did all of your homework from uh, the Gospel of John that we looked at from Good Friday service, which was like a lot of reading. I said to read that whole, that whole section between... Uh, you know, starting at, I think it was chapter 14 or the middle of 13, all the way through to the death on the cross because it's, it's Jesus' final will and testament. And he shares some amazing things. Hopefully, you, when you read it, you were like me going, yes, I had my pen out. I had my highlighter out. I was writing the notes and just praising God for the word that Jesus spoke to us and the hope that he gives through his word. So some of you guys did that homework. Today's homework is going to be a couple more things. I'll give it to you right now. You can jot it down. You can do whatever. But the first one is I want you to read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because really what it is is, a, is an apologetic letter that Paul is writing to prove the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to, we're going to take a, little bit, a few nuggets out of it and then get into um, some more uh, historical academic stuff. So read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Also, I challenge you to go ahead and find and read um, every account of the resurrection. I mean, just read the last between one. I think Gospel of Mark is just one chapter that talks of the, re the resurrection. And then I think the Gospel of John is like two or three chapters of the resurrection. And after, read from the resurrection, the empty tomb, after of every gospel. So there's your homework, okay? But if you look at, and hopefully you've had time now to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, if you look at starting in verse 12, um, the Apostle Paul is addressing an issue in the Corinthian church. And the issue is, there were people in the Corinthian church that were, were, were leaving the doctrine or the belief of the resurrection. And they were saying, no, there is no resurrection after the dead. You just die and then nothing. And so, so Paul is correcting this thought, and he says there in verse 12, now, if Christ is preached that he has been risen from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So Paul's looking at this argument saying this does not make any sense from the standpoint of a believer in Christ that believes that he died and rose again. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is is also empty. Powerful words. Verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God raised up Christ, whom according to what you're saying, he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. So we got this interesting kind of apologetic and defense there. And I don't know if you're picking up the same vibe I'm picking up from Paul in verse 15. But what I'm picking up from Paul in verse 15 is he's saying, if you don't believe this, you're calling me and every other apostle and every other person that ever saw the resurrected Jesus a liar. You're saying those witnesses don't count. You're saying those testimonies don't count. So you kind of, you got to stop and think about what you're saying because I'm telling you I'm an eyewitness of the fact. That's what Peter's or Paul is saying. I'm an eyewitness of the fact. And also, guess what? He's acknowledging Peter being one, James being one, John, all of the twelve. He's acknowledging that there are more even than that that have seen Jesus alive. This is key. This is very important. The testimony that we're going to be looking at today 
the one that Paul's talking about, is not just an empty tomb. Though that is going to be a part of it. The reality is the testimony of the witnesses isn't that they went and saw an empty room, an empty tomb, a tomb with no body in it. The testimony of the witnesses that we look at today aren't saying that. They're saying they saw a risen Savior. And not only did they see the risen Savior, as we look through the testimonies, and, and these are the ones you're going to see if you do your homework, you're going to see that people talked with Jesus, had conversations with Jesus. Jesus did Bible studies with them to show them who he was. We're going to also see that Jesus walked with them down the road, that they touched Jesus' body and the marks that were left in him. I'm grabbing the palm of my hand as, as uh, probably the Passion of the Christ, which history says it was between the joints of the wrist. Anyways, sorry, neither here nor there. But they touched Jesus, and then thirdly, they ate with him. They had fish with him. One of the accounts, they, he shows up in the room and he says, Man, guys, I'm hungry. You got anything to eat? Um, <laughs> he's risen physically, is my point. Physically risen. He is the firstborn of the resurrection. And then this next section of 1 Corinthians 15 is where Paul goes to show us how important the resurrection is for us as believers. Look, look with me at verse 16. Paul goes on to say, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. This is a big problem, church. Verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep or died, is what that means, in Christ have perished. There's nothing left. There's nothing after if there's no resurrection. They're just gone. They've perished. You know, the perish date. You know, it's like uh, the lettuce. The head of lettuce in the back of the fridge. You probably have one. It's juicy, but it's slimy as well. It's perished. It's gone. It's good for nothing. It's no more. Verse 19, if this life, if in this life only we have hope in Christ. I'm sorry, I'm reading that wrong. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. What, what, what? What's Paul saying right there? He's saying, look, if our only hope is in this life, and we're following Jesus who told us to lay down our lives, to take up our cross, to live for him and not the things of this world, and then we die and that's it, we're the worst off. We're the absolutely worst off. If you give up everything you have and follow Jesus to perish, there's nothing. But if, like he said, if you give up everything you had to follow Jesus, and there's a resurrection to come, and life after, and, and crowns of reward that we get to cast at his feet for saving us, and washing us in his blood, then we have everything to look forward to. This is key in the life of the believer. The doctrine, the belief in resurrection is key, and that's what we're getting at. And so, this morning, we're going to go through some facts about the resurrection. Hopefully, I'm going to put like four or five nice solid rounds in our six-shooter of apologetics to be able to say, this is some things that, I, that I've looked at and, and we want to research in order to give an account of these things. So this morning, we're going to look at some of these facts. We're going to look at some evidences for the proof of the resurrection because like we're looking at here, it is definitely of high importance. Oh, I just licked my finger. Don't shake my hand. <clears throat> so the first thing that I want to mention this morning is this. We as Christians should, should, should look at the evidence. We should. We're believers. We need to look at the evidence of what we say we believe. We don't want to have blind faith. We do want to have faith. We don't want to have blind faith. Faith that just... Yes, I believe, Lord. We want to have faith that's solid. We, don't, we, we want to not check our brains at the door. Have you ever heard that saying? There used to be a guy that would be around here and he'd say, you know, sometimes people think that at church there's a brain bucket at the front door and you got to take your brain out, put it in the brain bucket, then go and then come back and put your brain back on when you go out to the world. Not so. That is not the case. We believe because of so many things. One of them is the overwhelming evidence that we have. We don't just want to have a burning in our hearts and trust only in that. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? We don't want to just trust in that burning of our heart. But listen, there is a burning in our heart 
There is the testimony of the Spirit living in us. But we do want to have faith like is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and I'm borrowing this from, I'm going to get through the list of the, the guys that I'm borrowing evidence from. You can say, you know what, call it what it is. I'm stealing it to give it to you. But those guys, they don't consider me stealing. Why? Because they want to give it away. It's the gospel. They want to give it away. So one of the first one that I'm going to be stealing from is Aaron Wall. He's the principal or the administrator, whatever you want to call it, at the Payson Christian School. And, and he starts out with this in his little booklet. By the way, really quick commercial, I have a stack of these booklets. And they're really kind of evan evangelistic tools. They're just a really quick read. And it says, The Resurrection, Fact or Fiction. And he does a great job of just really quickly laying out some ideas. I'm going to use a, a little bit from his um, and a lot from some other guys. But I'm just thankful to have that resource. Also, if you really want it, message us, uh, even right here in the comments. Make a comment that you want it because there's free digital copy on Amazon. It's just kind of hard to get to. But I'll send you the link. So message me. But if you want the pamphlet, as a witnessing tool to keep in your truck or your pocket or your backpack, whatever, and give to somebody. Please, we want to give that to you. We want to give out the gospel. But in, in uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I want to talk for, for a minute. So faith is a substance. It's a thing. It's a substance. There's, it's kind of like a sort of a tangible thing that we get built in our lives. It's a substance of things that are hoped for. Now, that section of scripture, I got to mention really briefly, I want to talk about the word hope. The word hope in the Greek is elpizo, okay? And the word hope, when you kind of do a little bit of digging into the Greek, you see that this word, as it's translated here, a couple of things. Number one, this word, it's the only time that it's translated in the New Testament, things hoped for, that phrase being one word. The majority of the times, 18 times in the New Testament, this word is translated trust, simply trust. Not hope like I hope for, but it's something I trust in, okay? And the definition of that word trust is this. Number one, to expect. Something you're expecting. To expect. And number two is, or to wait for with full joy and confidence. To wait for with full joy and confidence. And I, and I just can't help but looking at that and say, now faith is the substance of things that we expect and are waiting for with full confidence. The evidence of things not seen. Amen? <clears throat> Now, one of those things that we place our faith in is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which leads to that faith in our assured salvation, the thing we're expecting, our personal resurrection. We have trust in what Jesus said and what he did and the evidence we're going to look at. And because he rose first, we're coming next. Praise God, we're coming next. And that's something I like to say. I know it's cliche, maybe a little bit cheesy, but my hope is out of this world, and it's true. But we as believers should ask questions. Listen, we should even ask the hard questions in order that we can have this assured expectation. Again, not in nothing, but with reliable evidence in something that is historical, that's factual, and that is true. So let's get into some of the evidence this morning. Uh, some of these facts this morning that I want to look at in regards to the resurrection. Because again, if it's true, and I believe with everything in me that it is, then it's pretty important. Because if it's true, according to Jesus, our eternity, according to Paul, our eternity hinges upon it. So we're going to look at it. Now again, this is what I wanted to mention. Disclaimer. You may have heard some of this before. Uh, side note, it's good to hear it again. But... If you haven't heard any of this, man, I just want to encourage you one more time. Please share this with people. Share this. I don't care if it's share, like click the share button and just share it on your page or your wall or whatever it is. But just share this with people. Because it's always good to hear the evidence for we believe. And I'm going to quote from a few different sources. Um, the leading authority on the evidence for the resurrection is a guy named, uh, a professor named Dr. Uh, Gary Habermas. So, so he's one of the ones that, even some of the guys that we're looking at in through here that I'm going to quote, they're quoting from him. They're pulling from him. 
So uh, he's the main one. So he's got books and resources. You can look him up. I'm also going to pull from Lee Strobel quite a bit. Uh, Jay Warner Wallace, man, he's he's awesome. If you guys haven't heard of him, he's a cold case detective, and he's still working, as far as I know, uh, for uh, L.A. County, and he's he's a, one of their top cold case detectives, and he takes um, he takes the evidence from a cold case perspective, because that's what it is. It's You just read all the articles about it and what happened and the events and the testimonies, and you have to build a cold case. Anyways, he applied that to the Gospels and said, I had no choice. The evidence was overwhelming. I had to believe because it was beyond a reasonable doubt that it was proved. I just love those minds that are like steel traps. I don't have one of those minds like jello gelatin. But minds that are like steel traps that look at stuff like this and just go, wow. And they research it. Of course, you guys probably know the story of Lee Strobel. He was a, I almost said evangelist. No, he was a, uh, 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 I can't think of journalist. it. Journalist. Look him up. Journalist. Boom. Thank you. He was a journalist, very skeptic, and went through the same thing, interviewing all of the authorities on the New Testament and, uh, and the life of Jesus and the resurrection that he could. Of course, the, uh, the evidence proved to him, and he became a born-again believer. Josh McDowell, same thing. I'm going to pull a little bit from him. Same testimony. Um, and then Aaron, uh, Aaron Wall, a lot of the same testimony as well. Um, and, and just an, uh, to me, just uh, so awesome to see these men. And uh, let me just tell you one more testimony really quickly. And I, I'm taking up too much time on these. But Josh McDowell, um, as I was researching this, he spoke of... Um, I think his name was Dr. Greenlee or Dr. Greenleaf. I'm not exactly sure, but he was um, uh, he he was one of the original beginner starters of um, the Harvard Law Division. And he what he did was he came up with like these this three rule and I don't know it by heart or anything, but this this three main rules of being able to find out if somebody's telling the truth or not in, in, a, in a court of law. And so he made these rules and it was the one that established it and was an atheist. Well, three of his kind of young Christian whippersnapper students challenged him to take those three laws and to apply them to the Gospels. Of course, kind of because of pride, he had to accept the challenge because he was the authority on it. Long story short, he looked at the evidence and came to the conclusion, it's all true and became a believer in Jesus. And the reason I'm sharing those testimonies with you is to challenge you. If you don't believe me, prove it. And I'm not saying that so you know, get on Facebook and beat me up, whatever. If you wanna do that, that's fine too. I'm saying it so that you will look for yourself, so that you won't trust anyone, so that you'll question everything and look for yourself. So, we've already looked at why it's important uh, to us as Christians, but I want to give you, and I'm talking of the resurrection, but I want to give you another reason why we need to look at this. Uh, I, you know, and I've, I'm redundant here, but anyone could claim to be the Son of God, but not only did Jesus claim that he was the Son of God, he prophesied that he would rise again. And if he has successfully done this, then he has successfully validated his claims, verifying who he says he is. So we're going to look at Dr. Habermas' four E's. We're going to look at four main topics um, that are arguments against the case for Christ. And we're just going to look at these kind of four main ones. Although there, let me just tell you, there's a list of like, I think it's like 12. I could be wrong, 13. I think there's more than that. So you can always continue this research further. But these four important things are things that we're going to look at that we need to consider as we, as we look at the evidence of the recorded history, which is what we have, of the eyewitnesses and the records in the Bible and the records outside of the Bible. Another note here is that there is a lot more evidence than what we're going to look at this morning, but we're just going to try to hit on these main points. The first one, if you're taking notes, the first E that we're going to look at is the execution. The execution of Jesus. And so Jesus had to be executed and he had to die in order to raise from the dead. Now, among scholars, New Testament scholars, there are virtually no disputes of anyone against the evidence or that basically the historicity, the, the validation of 
Jesus being executed. They all believed that he was a real man. They all believed that he lived and walked this earth. They all believed that he was executed under Pontius Pilate, as told by the available documents that we have, again, including the Bible. Also, it's important that they agree that Jesus was crucified, and they do, and that he died from that crucifixion. So another, another note on the crucifixion is this, and this is an, an interesting bit of information. There is no historical record anywhere, anywhere that we know of, that reveals that anyone has ever survived a crucifixion. It's an important note for us to take which would really address a couple of uh, rebuttals from the world. They say, well, he basically passed out on the cross, and when they took him down and they wrapped him up, they didn't know he was still alive, and then he woke up later. Or the other one that he kind of conspired with the disciples, that they gave him some kind of drug or whatever it was, that everyone thought he was dead at a certain point. They dipped a, uh, the sponge when he said, I thirst, and some hyssop and his poison, and they put it on there, and he almost died, and he didn't. Um, those things uh, are, are not something that they consider because everyone on history and historical record has died from a crucifixion. There was no passing out. There was no falling asleep. Let me just tell you this. If you passed out on the cross, you were dead. Uh, needless to say, you could no longer lift yourself up in order to take a breath if you were unconscious. So those things just go against the history of the cross. Not to mention another fact that we have, that Jesus' crucifixion wasn't an average crucifixion. It wasn't a normal crucifixion because Jesus was beaten to within what most scholars say inches of his life or his death. The, people would, would, the, the reason, if you remember, that Pilate had him beaten so bad was because he didn't want to kill Jesus. He said, this man's innocent. And so he had him beat up until inches of his death so he could bring him back out and present him to the crowd and say, look, here he is. We beat him senseless. There's no reason to kill him anymore. He's gotten what he deserved. And he said, behold the man. What, what would you have us to do? You know, basically the whole story. They started yelling, crucify him. And he wanted to release Jesus instead of Barabbas because they had this tradition of releasing someone from prison on the Passover to try to appease the Jewish people. They said, release Barabbas, the murderer and crucify Jesus, the innocent lamb. So, no, they didn't say innocent lamb. I added that in. So, all of this makes it an abnormal crucifixion because he was beaten so, so severely before he was crucified. Which would give us uh, kind of insight into the account of him not being able to carry his cross because his body was in complete shock. Uh, it, it, he went into shock from the trauma that he had faced uh, at, the, at the whipping block, if you will. I got another note here. An article in the Pure Review Scientific Journal of the American Metal Association, I said metal, Medical Association, analyzed the historical and medical records of the crucifixion and determined this, this is a quote from Lee Strobel's uh, stuff, Clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound was inflicted to his side. Again, that study from the American Historical Medical uh, Scientific Journal. They reviewed all of the evidence that they had, again, in the Bible and outside of the Bible, and said he was dead. There's no mistake. One reason, one of the reasons that this is not disputed among scholars in the field is the number of records of these historical events. So I'm going to talk just for a moment about the number of records of these historical events. For most historical records coming from this time in history, there are like one or two sources available for review. In the case of the crucifixion, not only do we have the four sources from the Gospels of the Bible, but we also have ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his death. And these, a small list, uh, Josephus, Tacitus, uh, Marmir Sarpian, Sarpesian, I, I'm probably saying that one wrong, Lucian. Listen, even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was crucified and killed in their own writings. So it was well established 
so well established that it's not even argued. It's not even up for debate, up for debate, excuse me. Even atheist New Testament scholars agree. And here's a quote from one of them named Gary Ludeman from Vanderbilt University. He says this, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. I mean, there we have it. Some very powerful evidence. Okay, the second E that we're going to look at is early, because it's important how early these records were found. The earlier, the more uh, reasonable it is that they are true and better, and the longer amount of time we have, it's, it's easier to assume that this was a legend developed over time, over centuries and centuries, um, that it really wasn't a resurrection. It was really a legend. An epic, if you will. But according to Lee Strobel, that is no longer a theory that can be re respected at all. Why? Because the evidence, there is evidence of a creed of the earliest church. This evidence to me is awesome. And, and that's kind of why I asked Caleb to sing that song that we call Creed. The creed that says, I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the resurrection. Uh, all of those things, and I know I'm missing a few there, but that's what a creed is. A creed is a record of beliefs that are agreed upon by church leaders, and they record it. They put, it, they put pen to paper, and in this case, it's from the very first Christians, the first century of believers after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and this creed included that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus was buried, and that on the third day he rose from the grave. Then it goes on to list names of specific eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses, including skeptics and opponents of Jesus, whose lives were changed 180 degrees because they encountered the resurrected Jesus. There were more than 515 people listed in this creed as witnesses to a risen Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I read this, I think this is really exactly what they were doing. They were getting together as a church collectively saying, let's get all the evidence that we have and let's talk about what we believe and why we believe it. And they made this list of what they believed and the evidence and the witnesses that they had to prove why they believed what they did. This creed, according to Dr. Habermas, can be dated on a timeline, and this is the reasoning of the dating. If Jesus died between 30 and 33 AD, and, and Paul wrote 1 Corinthians about 22 years after the death of Jesus to the, to the church in Corinth, and made reference to this creed in chapter 15, that's your homework chapter, in chapter 15, quoting that there were over 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus at once. And he even lists some of them. Then it would be safe to say that, first of all, our first uh, assumption, that within 20 years of the event, of the death of Jesus and the resurrection, there was a record of people who had seen the resurrected Savior. That's pretty early. 20 years is very powerful. You might think 20 years is a long time. Uh, listen to this. The first and second biographies of Alexander the Great were written 400 years after the actual events and are considered to be greatly uh, trusted and reliable. But we can go back to 20 years, but listen, we can go back to earlier than that. How do we go back earlier than that? Well, we know that Paul used to be Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of Christians, a killer, a hunter of Christians. He was a Jew that hated Christians. One to three years after the death of Jesus, on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus, and he becomes the Apostle Paul. He's converted. He sees Jesus, he speaks with Jesus, he's converted, and immediately he goes into Damascus and meets with some apostles. Many scholars believe this is when the, uh, the creed was given, when it was made, as he goes immediately into Damascus, hanging out with some of these scholars. Now, this would be the same creed that he later mentions in the book of 1 Corinthians. Some scholars say, no, it might not have been at that time. It might have been about three years after that, because three years later, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He meets with, uh, for 15 days with two eyewitnesses of the resurrection, 
who are named in the creed, Peter and James, and he spends 15 days with them, which is noted in the book of Galatians. And here's an interesting thing to that note in the book of Galatians. The word used to describe his visit with the two is a word used for an investigation and an inquiry. So Paul is trying to line out the facts of what happened with Jesus. So he goes, finds a couple of guys that hung out with them during his life, and has an investigative query, inquiry, I'm sorry, into. Many scholars say this is when the creed was given to Paul. So after looking at this evidence, it would mean that it would have been between one and six years after the event that Jesus was crucified and raised that these documents were already in existence, which would mean that the beliefs that make up the creed go back even earlier virtually to the cross itself. All that to say, there's no huge gap of time in order for someone to produce a story or an epic. In fact, uh, James D. G. Dunn, one of the greatest scholars in this area of like epics and time, says that we can be entirely confident that this creed was formulated within months of Jesus' death. And then the greatest ancient historian who ever lived is A. N. Sherwin White of Oxford, who studied the rate at which legends are developed in the ancient world, determined this. Listen, the passage of second of two generations of time is not enough for a legend to develop and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. Legends do not develop that fast. So we have the authority on it saying there's not enough time. Even two generations of time is not enough for a, a legend to develop that closely to the truth of an event that happened. But if that wasn't enough, we also have the letters of the Gospels which were circulating so fast they were circulating during the lifetimes of contemporaries of Jesus. So the writings of the New Testament were circulating so fast that they were circulating during the lifetimes of people who were Jesus' contemporaries. So what, you might say? Well, this would also include his adversaries who would have been happy to correct any misinformation and to point out that those things weren't true. But this didn't happen in history. The third E, moving along, that we want to look at is the empty tomb. So we have a tomb where Jesus was buried. It's sealed with the Roman seal. By the way, that doesn't mean like with mortar, a seal, like so that it wouldn't come out. It was sealed like with a, with a, a strap and, a, and an emblem of the Roman seal on the front, basically. To, to, so it was kind of like when you tape over a letter, right, to know that the seal hasn't been broken. You tape over a letter, you sign it, and then if somebody cuts it, well, the seal's been broken. That's the idea of the Roman seal. But it was sealed, it was also guarded, and yet it was empty on resurrection morning. One historian, William Craig, stated that the sight of Jesus' tomb was known to Christians and non-Christians alike. If it were not empty, it would have been highly unlikely for a movement based on the resurrection to have exploded into existence in the very same city where these events had occurred just a few weeks before. Pretty solid uh, uh, thought right there as to say, look, if there was a body in that tomb, there's no way, no way that this would have taken off. Maybe it would have taken off around the other side of the world, but not in the very city where the tomb was at. Another evidence that we have to look at, according to the tomb records, and I'm going to go over this really quickly, it's called the criterion of embarrassment, which basically says that if you were trying to convince Jewish people of a lie, you wouldn't include information in the testimony that you were writing that would embarrass you or, or that would be uncredible. And so the whole thing behind this is that in this culture, if you remember, who were the first to find Jesus in the empty tomb? It was a group of women. It was Mary. It was Martha. It was, it was um, also a couple, I read it. we're going to read them in a minute. So you just do your homework. You'll see who those are. I think it's Joanna and something with an S. I can't remember it. That's all right. Salome. Salome? I don't know. Whatever. Salome? Eh. Pupui. Anyways. 
It was women. Now, why is that important? Because in that culture, women were not considered to be credible witnesses. Not in our culture, in that culture. In court, their testimonies were considered to be as reliable as children. So, if the record was a fabrication, there would be no logical reason to list a woman or a group of women as the first witnesses. They would have used more credible things that wouldn't have been embarrassing to them. So, reporting the truth in this situation, in that culture, would have naturally, that would have naturally been an embarrassment because it was true. So they recorded something that was embarrassing because it was what they recorded, because it was the report, it was the truth of what happened. The next little segment <clears throat> within the empty tomb is this. It's called enemy attest attestation, attestation, which looks at what the enemies of the opponents of Jesus were saying. So what the enemies or the opponents of Jesus were saying at the time. We know that if the disciples of Jesus had said the tomb was empty and it was not true, we know the enemies of Jesus would have said, what? That's, that's foolishness. Let's go down to the tomb and we'll prove it right now. They wouldn't have let this go on. They would have said, no, let's go look at his body. Let's open the tomb and we'll prove it, which would have forced the disciples to prove it. But they didn't need to, because what we find of his enemies is that they had no clue where the body was either. They didn't argue about it at all because the body wasn't there. In fact, what we see in the text is that they were backpedaling. We see in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 11, that they were bribing the soldiers, fabricating stories, that they were doing whatever they could to stop the spread of the truth of what was happening instead of just shutting it down. And personally, my belief is, if this would have gone on, the, the, the Jewish re religious rulers would have pulled Jesus' body, put it on a cart, and walked to Jerusalem and said, look, he's dead, and squashed what was happening. But they couldn't squash what was happening because Jesus was alive. So by trying to explain how the tomb became empty, the enemies of Jesus are actually agreeing that it is empty. All historians agree that according to the historical documents, the tomb is empty. That's really not the question. The real question is, how did it get empty? How did it get empty? Did the Romans take his body? Now, the Romans, we would say this wouldn't have benefited the Romans in any way, shape, or form. If you look at the text there, Pilate is trying to keep riots from starting. Why would he take the body of Jesus, make it look like he rose, and start a riot? It's nothing that the Romans would have wanted to do. Uh, the second group, the Jewish leaders, would they have taken the body? They wanted Jesus dead. There's no reason for them to take the body. The third group, the disciples, would they take the body? Well, we got a couple of thoughts here. No, number one, they didn't have the means to take the body against this stone, against these troops, nor did they have the opportunity to do it. And also, if you look at the historical record, they were split up. They were scared. They were scattered. They were doubting. They were afraid. They were locked in a room and about to return to their jobs to give up on the whole thing. The best explanation that we have is that Jesus physically rose from the grave. Which brings us to the fourth E, which is eyewitnesses. And we're almost done here, bear with me. We get most of these accounts at the end of each of the Gospels and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Over time, Jesus appeared alive and well, resurrected in over a dozen different in instances to more than 550 people. Not only to his believers, but also to skeptics and to doubters. He appeared indoor, he appeared outdoor, he appeared and talked with them, he appeared and ate with them, and he appeared and touched them. So remember, we looked at the fact that if, if most were, people were lucky when looking at ancient historic records, they were lucky if they had two sources. We have no fewer than nine sources of eyewitness sightings and their encounters with the resurrected Jesus. 
The record of the disciples is one at the end of the Gospels. We have, we have those four, but we're, let's look at them right here. Okay, so first we have is this creed that we mentioned uh, earlier. Highly powerful proof of the eyewitness. The second we have is Paul's testimony. And Paul's testimony of, of being with Jesus, encountering him, and also about the disciples in 1 Corinthians 15, 11. We also have the book of Acts and the reports of what the church believed in the book of Acts, like in Acts 2, 32, where the truth is preached that Christ was resurrected from the dead and 3,000 people agreed and the church was born. Like I said, the Gospels. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we have two sources from disciples of the disciples, from disciples of those apostles, followers that the church was handed down to. Uh, the first one is Polycarp, who was appointed by John uh, in the church of Smyrna as a bishop. And he wrote a letter to the Philippians referring to the resurrection of Jesus five times, saying that they did not love this present age, but for him who died for our benefit and for our sake, and who was raised by God. We have a, a letter from Clement, ordered by Peter. I'm sorry, ordained by Peter, who wrote a, a letter to the church in Corinth, saying that they have complete certainty caused by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's so convincing and overwhelming that atheist scholar Gerard Luderman said after examining this evidence, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which they appeared, in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. So we had an atheist looking at this information and quoting, it's certain that they had an experience with Jesus. And that's the key word he uses, experience because his explanation of this goes on to say they must have had hallucin hallucinations. So there's this, there's this thought, there's this possibility that the disciples were so excited and wanting and expecting a resurrection to happen that they all hallucinated. Now, uh, Lee Strobel and a couple of the other guys that I mentioned earlier, they went and interviewed um, experts on psychology who examined the hallucination theory. Lee Strobel is one of my favorite because he just goes and he's a journalist and he just interviews these people that are experts. And so he interviews this guy and he says, hey, what, what's going on? Can this happen? And the guy said, absolutely, hallucinations are possible, but what you are talking about is completely impossible. Why? You have to understand something about the nature of hallucinations. Hallucinations happen to an individual. They're a lot like a dream. So they can't happen to over 500 people at the same time, the same hallucination. In fact, one of, one of the people that were interviewed on this told Lee Strobel, if 500 people had the same hallucination at the same time, that's a bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. It's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely out of this world. It'd be like me waking up in the morning and telling my wife, oh man, you're bored a bit. How'd you like that dream I had last night? And she's like, oh yeah, I know. It was great. No, that never happens. People don't dream the same thing. And so having hallucinations is such a far stretch. But especially as we look at the evidence, there were people who did not want Jesus to come to them, were not expecting him to be resurrected, had never heard that he was to be resurrected, like Paul, who encountered Jesus, was transformed, his life was transformed. Also, another skeptic of Jesus was James, the half-brother of Jesus, who definitely was not anticipating his half-brother to resurrect. But we have his name in the list, that Jesus came to him, and after speaking to him, his brother became a church leader and believe that his half-brother that he grew up with in the same home was God the Son who had been resurrected. Some powerful, strong evidence, not to mention all of the apostles 
who went from cowering in a room and deciding we're going to go fishing instead. This is, he's dead. We've got to just move on with life. Who encountered the resurrected Jesus and lives were transformed and changed into powerful preachers. In fact, so powerful that the Jewish leaders would say of Peter, who, where is he? He's, yeah, he's unstudied. How is he saying the things that he is saying? How is he quoting the things that he is quoting? I want to give you, leave you with one more question. And the question is this. Do people die for a lie? And if you've never heard this before, you might think, uh, no, no one dies for a lie. Well, that's not the truth. People die for lies. But the distinction is people don't die for a lie that they know is a lie. They believe it's true. And these 12 disciples, many of them were killed for what they believed. And the ones that weren't killed were ready to die for what they believed. And if those inner circle, those 12, were with Jesus, and they died for a lie, then they knew it was a lie that they died for. And they gained nothing for dying for this lie. Usually when people die for something, they're in it for a reason. They're in it to gain either riches or, or some romantic relationship. It's a common thing. People die in, in circles around a romantic relationship. Oh, you... You went with my girl, boom, it's over. That kind of thing. Or to gain power or prestige. If, if what they die for is true, they died to lose everything in this life in order to gain Jesus and so that we might gain Jesus and the knowledge of the truth of who he is and that he has resurrected so that we can be resurrected as proof of who he is. And so in closing this morning, may we look at the evidence and may we believe. And I want to read a quote from Jesus from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said to him, he's talking to doubting Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to you. And, and I pray this morning that the truth of what we've looked at would stir in your heart. If you're doubting, if you're skeptical, if you're unbelieving, I ask of you, I challenge you to look this up for yourself. I'm not asking or challenge you to get on social media and, and, and to, to get with a group of people that think like you think and just say, oh yeah, this can't be, this can't be. I'm asking you to actually dig. I'm asking you to actually look for the evidence. Because I believe with all my heart, you will change your mind. So, in closing, I mean, I want to call, I want to call you to believe in Jesus. I want to call you to put your hope, your assured, your in, uh, expected hope, your assured expectation upon Jesus and the hope that we have because he has risen from the grave. So turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and let's close, in fact, stand with me. Stand with me, grab the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. We're going to start right at the beginning. We're going to read this account of him rising. This is a historical account proven to be historically accurate. The Bible itself proven to be historically accurate by uh, geography, by ancient archaeology, by uh, looking at, at manuscript evidence. All of it points back to this being very valid, very trustworthy and reliable. And so let's look at this account. Chapter 24 of Luke. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, the girls, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in garments. I want to ask you to do something a little crazy. Would you read verse 5 aloud with me? Verse 5. It says, Then... As they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, 
they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Continue in verse 6. He is not here, but is risen. He is risen indeed. Sorry, I know you're still reading. I just I can't help it. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and the third day be raised again, and they remembered his words. Here it is. Here's the truth. I'm going to continue on. You don't have to read with me. If you want to, go for it. Verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the Mary, of, uh, the Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with him, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed uh, to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose, and he ran to the tomb, stooping down, and he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what, he had, at what had happened. Just a note really quickly in the Gospel of John. It notes, an anonymous note, that another disciple was there, whom Jesus loved, and ran faster and beat Peter to the tomb. And Peter burst in beside him into the tomb itself, and he saw the clothes laying there, but he also saw the head, the garment that would have been wrapped on his head, folded neatly and placed to the side. I like it. Verse 13 now behold, no wait, is that where I'm at? Yes, that's it, verse 2 3. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they, talk, they talked together all these things, of all these things which had happened. And so it was, while they conversed and, and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happen there in these three days or in these days? Verse 19. And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests of our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen also a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see, but him they did not see. And they said to them, he said to them, O foolish ones and slow to heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward the evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scripture to us? So they rose up that very hour. Oh. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that happened to them on the road and how he was known to them 
in the breaking of bread. We'll stop there. <laughs> the rest of it's your homework. How awesome. How awesome to believe and to know and to have that assured hope, that expectation that Jesus is risen. That the one that we believe in is true. That his words are true. And I would say, if you're a great part of the great cloud of witnesses with me this morning, that there's so many more evidences to the truth of the risen Savior in our lives. There's so many more things that he's done. He's so good. He walks with us. He talks with us. He helps us through these trying times. And we're so thankful to know him. I'm going to ask Caleb to come up and close out with the song. And he, as he's coming up, can I just ask you to bow your hearts with me? Lord, we come before you this morning. And I, I pray that if there's anyone listening this morning that hasn't accepted you, that their eyes would be open, that their heart would be open. God, that they would want a relationship with the true and living God. Lord, we're so thankful that we don't have to, to go look at a tomb and, and pay homage to a great man, but that that tomb is empty, that you are alive and well, that you can be with us, Lord. But as you even said in the Gospel of John, it's better that I go because then I can send the Holy Spirit, the Helper, to be with you, and he will be in you. So, Lord, I... I I pray this morning and I say this morning, will you come into my life and in my heart in a new and fresh way, God? Will you come into the hearts of the people that are agreeing with us in prayer this morning, God, in a new and a fresh way that in this trying time we would be light, we would be hope, we would be salt, the representation of just a flavor in this world. It's different. That we should be because we know the truth and the truth has made us free. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in the things in this life. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and Him crucified and risen from the grave. God, we thank you for this truth. We bring our hearts before you and we worship together. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. opportunity this time to get together as a church and to look back to the truth of your word, who you are. That we have a hope. Oh, it's a hope not like I hope. It's a hope that's a trust in the true and living Savior. Praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. 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 It's good to be with you and celebrate with you. I just want to challenge you, if you've accepted Jesus, if you've said, yes, this is, makes so much sense and I want to follow or know more or find out more, any resources, please uh, message us. Message me. You don't even have to use uh, the public thing. Just hit me up on Messenger. Say, hey, I saw that and I want to know more. We would love for you to grow in the knowledge of Jesus and in his goodness and grace. Amen. God bless you guys.